All right, here's an introduction. So a friend of mine suggested that I do a Q&A video where you ask for Qs and I give VAs. And I also thought I might collect some um, suggestions for videos as well uh, from that. So I decided maybe you want to come along for a picnic with me and Goldie so that I can look incredibly eccentric, um, which I am, but I'm aware of it with a huge family of people behind me throwing a frisbee around. Um, so hopefully that's not too distracting. Anyway, um, Andrianne's helping me out with the questions. Andrianne, what's the first question? I'm a first year McGill student coming from Alberta. I'd love to know some of your favorite spots around town. It's always tough to get to know a city. A head start would be pretty nice. That's it? Okay, real professional operation here. Well, congratulations on getting into McGill. I hear it's a good school. Um, and uh, congratulations on leaving Alberta. I hear it's a shitty province. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, Funnily enough, I'm in one of my favorite spots. I don't come here very often, but uh, right now we're in Parc Jean Drapeau on Lille saint Helen, and that is uh, a little island in the middle of the Saint Laurent uh, that was half constructed by tailings from the uh, metro construction originally. Um, and I really like it because uh, there's a subway station in the middle and you can get to it across the bridge. And pretty much within half an hour of, um, of most of the places uh, in town that are connected to the metro, you can be away from everything, unless uh, everything includes a large family that have um, decided to gather here as well on the same <laughs> on the same day. But basically, it's a huge park that's kind of underused. It's built for big events like um, Heavy Montreal and um, Oceaga. So um, all that overcapacity means that you can kind of get yourself lost in here and uh, get away from the noise of the city and. It's pretty great. The more common recommendations um, are basically just for like parks around town, like Parc La Fontaine or uh, Laurier or Angrignon Park. Um, I think the parks of Montreal were the thing that I first uh, loved about the city because unlike the parks in New Zealand and Yellowknife where I lived before, you could sit in the park and hang out with your friends and drink a beer all afternoon. And so they're like really social and fun and lively and great for people watching, you know, and I just I enjoy seeing hundreds of people just having a great time as much as the family behind is annoying for, their, uh, <laughs> for, the, for the amount of noise that they're making. If I wasn't shooting a video, I would be people watching the shit out of them. <laughs> so yeah, for, for me, uh, make some friends, head to Parc La Fontaine um, if you're at McGill uh, with a six pack sit on the bank and um, enjoy being in a vibrant city. You have many videos of moving to Montreal, but I'm not sure if it's directed to Canadians moving to Quebec or immigrants from everywhere elsewhere. I wanted to know the process of most of what you've already talked about, but with the tourist or work visa perspective. So this won't come as a surprise to anyone, but I am, I'm not from here, I'm not from Canada, um, but I was lucky enough to have my mother do a bunch of paperwork when I was very young so I didn't have to go through the immigration process that everyone else has to. Um, I am an immigrant, you know, just an uh, immigrant who lucked out. When you're an immigrant, you often end up being friends with a lot of other immigrants. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with the immigration process relative to most Canadians. So Canada is a federation with responsibility for uh, citizenship being something that the federal government takes care of. But basically, we're allocated um, a number of immigrants that we can choose the criteria for selecting. Most of them will require you to um, have a comprehension of an official language um, and um, a points-based system where the more things you can do, you know, the more French and English you speak, you kind of get yourself either bumped up the list or um, enough points to qualify. A lot of people will come in through a working holiday program which gives you a year or two in Canada um, where you can work like a local. Uh, I'm on my gap here at the moment. Yeah, yeah, no, it's amazing. Do not um, get the working holiday visa if you're going to be a tourist. So if you can come to Canada for three months, say, and just be on holiday and you plan on seeing the country and just hanging out. <laughs> and then I just thundered everywhere. <laughs> get the working holiday visa once you've decided you're ready to work and you want to get a job. They're very easy to get um, and it's quite quick. That way you won't piss away time uh, not getting points for your actual residency if you choose to get it. A lot of people will 
uh, get one or two year working holiday visa and spend the first nine months, you know, traveling around. And then when they decide, oh, I really like Canada, it's a really nice country, which most people are gonna do, it is a really nice country. Um, great option, you know. Uh, the US without the bullshit. They then go, oh, I better get a job. And they only have, you know, maybe 16 months to accumulate the work experience. People end up, especially because they often come here when they're young on a working holiday visa, not planning it out. Other than that, as with almost everything, the number one thing is speaking French. If you speak French, it's just gonna make it easier. Also, actually, if you are a overseas citizen or, or you know, a resident or you're immigrating, um, there's classes to learn French. And I took, um, I took half of one before bailing on it because I have a short attention span. Um, and uh, pretty much the whole class was immigrants and they pay you right so you can kind of coast on that whole thing and, and just like get by and get kind of subsidized to learn um, if you have a little bit of a nest egg um, to, to get moved over here. The experience for um, people on the refugee program or the people coming through the federal program uh, so the feds also have their own residency permits and passports to hand out uh, for themselves that I have, I have no idea about. What's your favorite public transportation system? <laughs> okay. So this is probably a consequence of me doing the transit videos. I'm not a transit, uh, super big transit guy, you know. Um, I can recommend uh, RM Transit for that. And there's a local YouTuber called um, uh, the Nova Bus Fan, Ben, ben Lohman. They, those guys are like transit YouTubers who have the spreadsheets of transit systems and are analyzing, you know, their efficiency and stuff. So for me, I'm going to be talking about my favorite transit system as a tourist, you know. I really like Montreal's and I think that once the REM goes in it's going to be the best in Canada. But um, my favourite uh, at the moment is actually Vancouver's and it's mainly because you arrive at the airport and there is a, um, a rapid transit connection to the, to the subway network. For most people visiting a city and going like, do I like this city's transit? Do I like that city's transit? You notice that, you know. When I've been to Vancouver, it go the SkyTrain gets pretty close to the places that I want to go and I get on it and I go there and it's frequent and it's kind of it's small and cute feels kind of nice you know like a little pod you know that you're whizzing around the city on so yeah no I like uh, I like Vancouver's transit a lot and I think they were proven right the SkyTrain um, technology that they decided to use that's the direction that most cities are going so you know they made good decisions too so yeah anyway Toronto's feels kind of rinky dink and old school um, it, you know, they've still got like tokens and shit. It's the ergonomics of it for me, you know. It's when you arrive in a, in a place and you look at the subway map, like if you arrive in New York and you're just like, what? You know, the, immediately when a network isn't kind of like, there's a platform, one rail goes that direction, one goes the other direction, it's color coded. The only thing on that line is this sort of train. Um, you know, when you start to get like a train or like in Philadelphia, these sorts of trains stop at every second stop or whatever. It's just like, think of a different way to solve this problem because this, uh, this is annoying, <laughs> this is annoying, you know. Okay, that's that question. Sorry, rambling. Can you tell us if the Cavendish link will ever happen? <laughs> Lol, never mind, it will never happen. Ah. <laughs> I don't know what that is. So this is like, a, okay, so this is another thing. You learn a place like you learn a language, you know? You kind of like get some big picture things, some key words, uh, how to say I, you know? But that doesn't mean that you're fluent. And I'm not fluent in Montreal. I know the subject areas that I've researched or stuff that I've done, but I don't know what the Cavendish link is. Uh, it sounds like a missing transit link that I haven't heard of. The Cavendish Link is an extension to Cavendish Boulevard that would connect Côte Saint-Luc to the Montreal borough of Saint Laurent. Oh, okay. And has been discussed for more than 50 years. <laughs> this would be a good example. I don't drive. Um, I don't even have a license. That's my way of, of um, firmly voting for transit-oriented society. But consequently, I don't know shit about roading projects, you know? Like I know about the PNERF BRT because of BRT. So yeah, I'll probably always have like a bit of a knowledge gap. Code St. Luke and Ville Saint Laurent is going to get um, pretty good for the new REM access, you know. So I kind of think a lot of this stuff also may be kind of like a, well, we've given, we've thrown them a bone um, once every whatever decade with blah projects. So that should uh, calm things for a while. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I don't, uh, I don't know enough, but I'm willing to admit that. What's your backstory? Where are you from? How did you fall in love with the city? Okay. Um, yeah, so asking someone their backstory is a pretty big question. I've done a bunch of things, lived a bunch of places. Open your mouth. <laughs> <What's>... <laughs> Open it wide. <laughs> 
and uh, came to Montreal for a summer back in like 2012 after a breakup. Um, I was like, I got to get out of this small town that I'm in and just, you know, give myself a fucking mental break from seeing my ex every once in a while. I moved here for a summer and lived with some people and was just like, man, what a nice place. I wish I could live here. And then I went back to Yellowknife. And then um, I kind of, I don't know why it didn't occur to me. I can live here. I'm a Canadian citizen. <laughs> You know, what, what was stopping me? Um, and then one day, uh, years later, I had the opportunity to choose where a remote um, office would be for the company. And um, I was like, well, Montreal's got pretty low cost of labor, low cost of office space. Like, it makes sense. Um, let's do it. So I got to move here. And what, what makes you fall in love with it? I mean, I just think Montreal's so easy to love. I don't know, like, um, when people come to visit me, from around the world. Uh, you can just see, they're like, this place is so nice, you know, it's just a nice, it's such a nice city and um, it's interesting. It's got a lot of layers to it. Most other places have um, just got nothing on it. I don't know how to say it any other way. Uh, in North America, a lot of cities are new, so they don't have the beautiful old architecture or the history to them. So it's got that. It's also got a crazy interesting uh, history to it. This is the spot these people were executed or a bomb went off on that corner. Or... And then the, the final thing is um, learning a language is a very fulfilling project. It's part of what makes the city um, something that delivers the satisfaction it delivers over the long term. Um, just gives you a nice little hits of, ah, cool, um, every once in a while. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just think it's really obvious why Montreal's great. The only thing that sucks is the weather. <laughs> but not today. You forgot the most important thing, that people here are great. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. People in Quebec often have this thing of like, we've got this fucking attitude, you know. We're not like the other Canadians because of that. Now, people in Quebec are very, very distinct from Canadians, but they do share the attribute that I like the most about Canadians are being actually very civil, very nice people, you know. I think it's the best attribute of a country actually. So we do share that um, cultural attribute here. So if you like how nice Canadians are in, you know, Edmonton, you're gonna like how nice Canadians are in Montreal as well, even though they are culturally very different in other ways. What's the connection to Yellowknife you've hinted at? Okay, so I mentioned this in a previous um, question, but I grew up with a Canadian citizenship in New Zealand, so I would introduce myself to people when I was like a kid in class being like, hi, I'm Paige and I'm a Canadian, mate, you know, <laughs> it was really, they're like, no, you're not, like, what's wrong with this kid, you know? So I was always looking forward to the day that I'd uh, exercise my right to uh, the citizenship. And uh, yeah, when I was 21, uh, I was like ready to go. It was just as the last financial crisis happened. And um, I decided to go for it with the most kind of extreme version of the Canadian experience. I'm Alec Dvogorski. I come from Yellowknife, which is in the Northwest Territory. More bears than people. That's the way I like it. <laughs> I've worked the winter roads north of Yellowknife. I've been... I, I moved to um, Yellowknife uh, in the Northwest Territories. And I lived there for like seven years on and off, you know? It, it was my, I guess my former Canadian hometown before moving here. The odd perspective of a New Zealander Yellowknifer becoming a Montrealer. So I'm sure that that is a unusual <laughs> take on the world. But it made me like Montreal so much because Yellowknife, I mean, it's not a bunch of shipping containers huddled around a, a campfire, you know, it is a, it, it's a small city, but um, it's very much the polar opposite. So when I came here, it was like, um, you know those videos of people when they, get the, when they get the glasses that correct their vision and they can see color? You know, it was just kind of like, it made Montreal so vibrant that it just imprinted on my mind. You know, I can still remember the entire bus trip on the uh, 747 into town um, from my first night, just because I was so, oh my, oh my God, it's overwhelmingly saturated with culture and um, excitement and, and, you know, I was, I would just walk around looking at like row houses on a plateau with my mouth agape, you know, like, oh, it's so beautiful. I mean, I like walk down the same streets now and I'm like, I'm not even that nice a row house. <laughs> so, so that's my yellow knife background. A background in making me appreciate what I have. So when are we getting beers? <laughs> Great. So I've been thinking about running a Montreal trivia night um, when all this uh, 
bullshit is over. Um, so I, th I think that would be a pretty good opportunity. Probably do that on a bar, but I guess it would be in 2021 at this rate. Um, by the way, everyone, uh, install the COVID app. Because if we all had that installed, I think uh, things would be a lot easier. And we could open the bars and go to bars without uh, everyone in the city who went to a bar having to line up to get tested a week later. Um, nice one, really smart. Wrong order of things. App, open bars. Not open bars, then app. Fucking. All right, rant. J'apprécie que tu fasses l'effort de parler. Something went in the hole. J'apprécie que tu fasses l'effort de parler français. Est-ce que tu vas faire une vidéo en français un jour? Ah, d'accord. Une question en français. Merci pour la recognition. C'est très difficile pour moi. C'est juste, uh, juste quatre ans que je parle en français. Uh, et aussi, uh, c'est pas une, um, une chose que j'ai une habileté naturelle avec. Uh, par exemple, oh voilà. <coughs> Um, je voulais faire des vidéos en français. À la point, j'ai uh, 10, 10, 000, 10 000 de subscriptions uh, sur le, le, le chaîne parce que mon vidéo est un peu vasé, un peu. Uh, la langue, est... mon, mon, mon connaissance en la langue est trop fucked. <laughs> Rudimentaire. <laughs> pour euh, le sujet. Mon plan est euh, plus en plus de vidéos vidéo en français, euh, mais, mais je, je pense que c'est nécessaire pour moi à revenir sur la chaîne pour l'assistance nécessaire pour faire des vidéos en français. Une vidéo en anglais, c'est centaure, mais une vidéo en français, pour moi, c'est deux centaures. Euh, ce n'est pas possible pour moi de finir le travail, mais je veux essayer parce que c'est mon rien. Salut! Parlez français? <laughs> non. Sound anglophone. Now we're on to the video ideas. Do more shit on the rim. <laughs> Great. Okay. Very abrasive um, proposal. Actually, this is a good point to make. I didn't want to do a video on the rim um, because I was like, well, you know, like, what's to say? But I put it up on Patreon and it got voted for. People wanted me to do a video on the rim. So I was like, okay, well, they, I am doing what they say, so I will do this video. Consequently, that video did really well and like, I mean, doubled my subscriber count. So I'm happy to keep doing the whole Patreon vote thing. So any of these suggestions, if you like them, um, please jump on and vote. I don't know what I would say about the rim, um, but um, I guess I could talk about the station naming uh, controversy and maybe a bit of a project update. Uh, anyway, sure. Uh, so, proposal one, the rim. Do a video on the West End Gang. Okay, so West End Gang, I've been thinking about organized crime in Montreal as a video. They're an old Irish gang, I think, um, from around Griffintown. I think they're still around, or they got rolled into the mob. Um, so maybe a, a video on the historic gangs of Montreal, and uh, or maybe like early, early organized crime in Montreal, or maybe like, um, a video on immigrants, immigrant crime gangs, like gangs that were kind of related to a specific wave of immigrants. Putin episode and Montreal fast food. So, so the reason I started doing these videos is because I was irritated by how often I would search like Montreal YouTube and all you'd get was like pages and pages of um, uh, YouTube travel vloggers um, eating a Schwartz um, smoked meat sandwich and going to Le Banquisque um, and going like, it's so weird. Um, so I don't know why you'd want to see me do that. Like, uh, it seems like a softball video, but fuck, you know, um, if for some reason you want yet another video of a man eating poutine, um, except this is a man who eats it all the time. So I'd just be like, yep, tastes like Friday night. Um, and I can also have a look at the, you know, fast food chains. I could do a tour of my favorite, my favorite hangouts, you know, they're all fucking mundane though. Like, I just like, I like the fundamentals, you know, like, like with the packs, you know. <laughs> There's nothing I like more than adding a poutine to the beer in the pack. Oh, perfect. Hollywood the banana bum from PSC. <laughs> Hollywood the banana bum from PSC? Like a construction contractor? No idea. Although the person did write this one would be good, 
Absolutely. <laughs> oh my god. I can't even put that one up because I don't even know what that is. Please, uh, if you know what the fuck Hollywood the banana bomb from PSC means. It's even worse than the Kevin, Kevin Dash link, was it? Okay, um, then if you know what that is, then you, yeah, let me know in the comments. MK Ultra and Dr. Penfield. Dr. Penfield, I can smell burnt toast. Dr. Wilder Penfield. He cured my seizures and hundreds more. They say he drew the roadmap of the human brain. We just called him the greatest Canadian alive. It would be, be great to accuse Dr. Penfield of being involved in MK Ultra. And while I was asleep, they were shocking the heck out of me with electric shocks. I'm pretty sure he wasn't. That would be quite a twist, though, to be hero, heroic Dr. Penfield. Does it smell like burnt toast right now? So these people had a barbecue. Yeah, so, um, yeah, sure, I could do a video on MK Ultra. It's come up, um, it's come up a few times when I've been researching stuff, um, specifically the Canadian Inventions video. Basically, the trials were um, the sort of science that was fairly commonly done in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s that you would never get away with. Uh, now I'm the reason that uh, ethics committees exist at universities um, today. So, yeah, I think they did tests on sleep deprivation or something, I think it was. You know, and these were all basically just kind of like U.S. military, how do we create super soldiers? Is there some edge we can get over the Soviets? What are the Soviets potentially doing? Just kind of trying to kind of Cold War era, crazy LSD, drugs given to unwitting participants. So yeah, it's interesting. I just don't know if it's one of those things where we're kind of like overplaying our hand, like oh, we're a critical part. We did, you know, how, all the experiments for that were done here, or we're just doing that thing, which I find a little bit of a bummer in a city that's got a lot to offer of like cl claiming an American thing because the Americans are so good at kind of uh, at creating these big deal um, things and not instead focusing on something that's actually genuinely um, a Montreal thing and Montreal had a huge part of. So Next. this one's from your mom? <laughs> she wants to know about murals and art. <laughs> okay. This video, honestly, I've actually started collecting the B-roll on it. I wanted to do a video on like um, the legal walls around town um, the street art scene and the mural, mural fest and, and just kind of like was Montreal early on that stuff. Anyway, I really wanted to deep, do a deep dive into it and just kind of the history of it and uh, where it's going and you know there is notably so much graffiti in Montreal compared to other cities in Canada. It's definitely a big part of the culture here so that's something I'm interested in uh, for sure. Uh, put that up on Patreon. Some people say that construction never ends in Montreal because of corruption. Friends have even suggested me to watch Bad Blood on Netflix. They say the story shown in the series is something still going on in Montreal. Mm. Do you know if that's true? Would you know why construction never ends here and it's all over the place? I've watched two videos where you talked about the projects for transportation and infrastructure, but I'd like to know if there's more than that behind of the constant construction in the city. <laughs> there's actually three videos on uh, transit, so you know, there's one video there for free. So the question is like, is the corruption playing a role in all this construction and stuff? So the answer to that is, um, is definitely worth a video. I have thought of doing a video called, is Montreal still corrupt? Um, so I'll put that up on Patreon for a vote. Montreal's kind of a victim of two things. One is that we did have a lot of corruption in the past. So these stories kind of linger, you know, the famous tale of the Olympic stadium, um, concrete uh, mixers or the mafia infiltration of the unions, for example, classic kind of Montreal stories. And I think we kind of like the corruption to some degree now um, from the past. It's these like, oh, in the old days, this place was so crooked. And it really was. I don't think what we're seeing right now is really the result of um, direct corruption. I think what it is, is um, maintenance on a um, large amount of infrastructure built at the same time. So uh, we had this massive cluster of infrastructure built um, in, the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, and then we didn't build stuff. So, you know, we we're basically bankrupted by the Olympics and uh, we underinvested in the maintenance because we didn't have money. And now it's just, you know, it's all, it's all due for being fixed up and replaced. So we're just in that era now. It's kind of like you have this big construction boom and then you have a big maintenance boom. Yeah, there'd be a bit of research to that, and I think it'd be interesting to answer the question. Musings on corruption. While most people automatically think stacked apartments with outdoor staircases when thinking about classic Montreal residential architecture, there's an architectural style that's ubiquitous within many parts of the city but never talked about. 
There is very distinct architectural style of duplexes found everywhere in neighborhoods like La Salle and St. Leonard, with staircases on both ends of the du duplex and usually two garage doors in the middle. Yeah. They're also often signed with the lozenge-shaped brick pattern. Yeah. I've know. never seen anything like it outside of Montreal, so it could be interesting to investigate where that style came from, or perhaps as a footnote on housing architecture in the city. Yeah, I know the style you're talking about. It's typically, um, yeah, it's like often white brick, definitely post-war, yeah. It's basically high density suburbia in a lot of ways. That's a good one. Actually, if anyone watching this is a local architect, or an architecture historian, I would be, um, yeah, I'd be interested in uh, chatting about the different neighborhoods and their kind of like um, hallmark uh, style. What's the deal with homelessness in Montreal? That's it. Okay. <laughs> um, I know that Montreal uh, has a, uh, at last uh, national survey, lower per capita homelessness count than the other cities. But I think that that was um, a product of uh, not uh, good government policy because I don't think we've implemented uh, housing first here. Um, after there was this uh, federal government kind of $120 million kind of trial um, that was like, yes, yeah, so it seems to work very well. And then I don't think any cities actually have implemented it. I don't think we have anything to be proud of. I think that the reason that homelessness was uh, historically low in Montreal and why it's going to become just as bad as anywhere else is because we have no housing. As housing gets expensive um, and there's less places to live, we squeeze out the poorest least privileged members of our society. I so often kind of come back to this refrain in my videos, but it's so important that we get rid of all this NIMBY policy and uh, absolute like fucking nonsense around, uh, around housing construction. There are so many easy things to eliminate um, and it should be the biggest priority of government is getting the vacancy rate above um, 3% again. Right now it is so low um, and I think we'll see that reflected in an increasingly large number of homeless people. Uh, living on the streets uh, in Montreal long term. Um, just one more of the thousands of terrible downsides to not building enough housing. We live in a society that seems increasingly kind, yet we have a worse and worse problem with homeless people and it's so complex, the, uh, answering that question. So yeah, no, I'd love to do that video. I think it's really, really interesting. Maybe you can do a series about Montreal's university and or the city's science and research infrastructure. Another could be explain the CGEP system to people. I think the CGEP thing is really interesting. It could potentially provide a bit of a model for how other places could run their schooling system. I think it's quite smart, but I don't really know a lot about it because I didn't go through the system. So um, yeah, I think that's really, that'd be a really interesting video, especially just for a fundamentals thing. The research infrastructure, maybe another video on kind of like what the universities are known for um, would be interesting because you kind of find out every once in a while, you're like, oh, that's weird. Like Montreal is quite well known for its engineering and stuff related to like aerospace you know oh yeah because of this industry it feeds in you know could be good but i'd be worried i'd be making kind of uninformed generalizations um more than usual <laughs> but yeah i can i could put that up for a video i just need to do the research for it so yeah i'll put it up on patreon um as a as a fundamental video i think for now all right Anyways, uh, we've run out of tape, so um, that's all for today. I have to wrap it up, even though there are um, more questions. I'll put uh, all the potential videos up on Patreon, uh, including ones I haven't gotten to. And uh, yeah, jump on there to vote and uh, support me doing this stuff. You know, it's, um, it's appreciated. The beer stein. <laughs> okay, Goldie. A little early, don't you think? How do they say that? Like, like father, like son? Uh -huh. All right. And a little bit of beer. And then he's just like, 